Warm welcome to the talk. I know about you, I feel like the first day, first show. It's awesome to be here. And uh, <clears throat> I'm so honored to be here talking about one of my favorite services, Amazon Event Bridge. My name is uh, Sheen Brussels, and I'm a serverless hero. And also happy to share that I'm currently writing a book on serverless on AWS with my colleague Luke. It's expected uh, uh, early next year. Now, AWS reInvent is an occasion, a celebration of technology, and also an opportunity to share and learn from each other. Just curiosity, how many of you are new to event bridge, new to event driven architecture? Be brave. Perfect. So hopefully, end of the session, you should be able to get inspired and take the message back to your teams, organizations, and have the event-driven architecture using event bridge in place. Um, it's a packed agenda, but don't worry, I will take you in parts, kind of incrementally. I will stop you, recap, and uh, move forward. So basically, we will cover uh, the basics of event-driven architecture, and then we will, we will look at why and how EventBridge comes into the picture and uh, look at some of the best practices when you think of events before we uh, dive deep into looking at some of the event-driven patterns. And I will close with a few of the FAQs, questions commonly people ask when they come across EventBridge and event-driven architecture. Now, before we move forward, I want you to go back, not that long ago, last year's reInvent, when Werner mentioned these two important things, asynchrony and event-driven. Understanding of these two are crucial for us to move forward in, in this, uh, today's talk. So let's look at uh, the two important things, asynchronous and event-driven. To understand asynchrony, you need to understand synchronous, right? So most of you must be familiar with uh, this sort of a simple pattern. An application requesting a service or, uh, you know, get me the price of a product, and then it gives back the price. You as a customer with the app, happy. It's a synchronous flow. Now, let's take it forward, and here we have two services. These are, you know, service-to-service -service communication. Let's say service C is order fulfillment, service D is payments. So before an order gets shipped, you need to capture or settle or transfer the funds for the previously authorized payments. So typically, service C, once in a few hours, or depending on the you know, uh, busyness of the uh, system, it will send a bunch of thousands of payment IDs to service D to do the capture. Of course, service is not going to hang around there because it can take hours, days, or maybe even weeks. So what it does is it sends an acknowledgement back with maybe with a batch ID. Now, we have a problem, right? Because how does service C knows the progress of the batch of payments? And it can sub submit multiple batches during the day, okay? So typically, service D will have some kind of status pool and it will open up an API endpoint for service C to, you know, poll or query. Now, it looks okay, but from service C point of view, it poses challenges. How soon it should start polling? How long for? And how frequently you should keep calling? So this is a situation with a typical command query CQRS kind of pattern. So let's take one step further. What if? Service C, you know, submits the payments like we did. Instead of service C asking for the status, D pushes the status to C as events. So here we are getting into this sort of event-driven territory, right? So rather than waiting, it sends every payment, whether it's captured, goes, out goes an event, service C can react, you know, perform the order shipment or et cetera. Now, equally, it is also common that uh, services push messages onto queues and for other services to consume. The point here is like, you start to see the loose coupling or decoupling of these microservices. That is one of the fundamentals for asynchronous event-driven architecture. So what is EDA? It's an architectural concept where events communicate 
and do uh, asynchronous, um, you know, sort of um, um, invocation and implementation pattern. Now, if you look at a simple event-driven architecture, there are four main elements. So here is, you know, a simple architecture. A service is publishing events onto a bus or a broker consumed by two or more uh, consumers or target services, and then it, they, they kind of, you know, carry on what they're supposed to be doing. So the four things, there is a producer or a publisher, and there is a consumer or the target for the events, and two most important stuff, one is the broker or the bus, and of course, the events. When it comes to a producer or a publisher, the common concept in the industry is like, you know, the producer needs to be agnostic of consumers. You shouldn't know. Now, it's true if you have a SaaS platform or something like that, but typically, if one of your colleagues' team is your consumer sitting behind, obviously they get to know, right? So there will be kind of understanding and influence by your consumers, but in general, it should be agnostic. And the other important point is, when you send an event, don't pack the entire thing. Just share what is required. This is like the least data privilege or you know, sharing principle equivalent to the security aspect. This is a mistake some you know, commonly uh, teams do. From the consumer point of view, they also have responsibilities. So they cannot always expect events to come arrive in an order. So they should be able to cope with you know, um, the orders, sorry, the events arriving in different orders. And most importantly, item potency. There is no guarantee every time that an event is going to be delivered just once. You may receive multiple um, events of the same type coming again. So you should be able to, you know, guard against those uh, uh, situations. Now, that takes us to the next one, the event broker or a uh, the carrier or the bus. So this is where event bridge comes in. And often it you know, supports you to ingest events from multiple producers or publishers and then safely deliver to several targets on the other side. In between, they may also provide you with the rules, transformation capabilities, and other features. Now let's take it to uh, event bridge. And, um, <clears throat> Typically what happens is when someone starts new with serverless, they start with an experimentation because everything is new, they need to kind of experiment, that's fine. So they keep adding, probably start with the Lambda function and this, you know, growing the serverless thing. But thing is, you get confused. The moment you have a SQSQ in place, your colleague will say, hey, now you need to have a DLQ or dead letter queue to capture all the errors. So you add a DLQ. Once you have a DLQ, someone else will say, oh, who is going to handle the messages coming to your error queue? You need a mechanism for that. Okay, so you add a Lambda function to cover that. Now you're confused. What do I do? Should I put the events back to the original queue or should I send to a destination event bridge? So this is typically how the architecture grows. And all of a sudden, you see a tangled event-driven architecture in front of you. Your architect will come along and say, hey, you know, microservices, anyone? So that's what you should be thinking of. Okay, let's do microservices. You then draw boundaries and you push all the services around. And then you're happy. But the problem is you try to deploy one microservice and you find everything else get deployed. So what we have is a tightly coupled service architecture. This is where event bridge comes in. So when you have a few microservices, they all produce events, rather than always you know, crisscrossing to resources within their own kind of boundary, they share events via event bridge, event bus. And then events can even flow between you know, the buses and the, you know, the whole situation being so harmonious Microservices can be independently deployable, and they, you know, each one is separate, everything is fine. Now, what is event bridge? So if you're not familiar, it's just an event bus, and it makes easy to connect with applications via events from you know, publishers to uh, targets. Right, so what makes an event bridge? 
So in core, there are three parts. One, the main part, the event buses. So if you're completely new to event bridge, go back and check your AWS console. You will find a default event bus there. So that is AWS event bus. All AWS services push events to the default bus. Then on top, you can create your own custom event buses. Then AWS also supports partner event buses as well. And on one side, you have producers. They push messages or the events onto uh, the event buses. On the other side, we have consumers um, receiving those events. But as I usually say, the power of event bridges in between the filtering and routing rules. That's where the magic happens. That's where you identify, okay, I need this event to go to these targets and perform these sort of transformations or the logic and things like that. So that's sort of the, you know, kind of the core of event bridge. But on, 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 on top, you have the several of its uh, features as well. Okay, let's move on to looking at uh, the fourth main element of event-driven architecture, events. So every event should have a unique identity, carry just the data, as I said earlier. But it's, it's hard when someone is new to event-driven architecture to conceptualize the event. So that's why you, you need to spend time to design, designing your events, because some of the teams make mistakes here. Now, typically you hear, if you went to any event storming session, the first thing you hear from the coordinator, guys, think in terms of past tense when you come to events, right? It's, it's not always, it's difficult for us to imagine that way. But that's how it, because it thinks something happened in the past. Now, if you look at the event bridge event uh, schema pattern, so this is pretty much it. So it has a bunch of things. And the mo most important part is the detail attribute. So that's where your payload, event data goes in, okay? And you can provide any valid JSON in there. But if you spend some time thinking of rich structuring, then it will make a lot easier. Rather than just dumping everything or anything as you like, think in terms of a structure across your team or teams and organization. So split it. Metadata and data, and what is metadata? And so in metadata, you can carry your own event identity, your own version of the event schema. You can say which domain emitted events, which service is coming from, what type of event this is. And also you can say TTL, how long the event should be kept by a consumer. The, you know, imagination is yours, your, your organization. So think that way, and then you know, have a something structure uh, working for you. And the data section is basically the instance of the data. So this is where your uh, particular payment, a specific order, or an insurance, these kind of things go in. Now, there are two ways I usually classify events. I mean, I know it's debatable, but uh, it's worth remembering and kind of you know, tailor it as you need. When it comes to categories, Domain events are the pure form of events. These are the events you share across other domains, across beyond your bounded context boundary, and this is the kind of, you know, the, the gold events for you. And then you have operational events. So these are the events that say, oh, this third party system is up or down. This service now, you know, uh, raised an alert or alarm. These are internal within your boundary so that you can, you know, uh, take actions. And then, of course, the local internal events, they are just you know, flowing within. They never go outside of your boundary. And then transformation, transformed events are like more anonymous events, like uh, source event comes into event bridge. And event bridge, as part of the event rule, you make some transformation. So rather than sending the every date, everything from the data, so you just say this is the, you know, everything from the event, you just say this is the data, because you know that metadata is not necessary for the, this particular target. So that's the transformed event in my you know, sort of way of saying. And then, of course, you have the AWS events. So except the AWS events, all the other events we usually know, uh, call, call as custom events, because those are our events 
we create and push mostly to the custom uh, event buses. On the types, again, it depends how you classify. You can mark as a data event or a, it's a query, so you, know, you get back an answer or it's a response. Again, there's no hard and fast rule here. It's up to you how it helps your teams to have you know, the structure in place. Okay, now, quick re recap. So we looked at synchrony, event-driven, and we looked at the, uh, the you know, event-driven architecture, the elements, uh, we took a look at event bridge, what it provides, and how to structure events, and uh, all good. Okay, let's move on. So let's change gear and look at uh, event-driven patterns. When it comes to patterns, I like this quote a lot, because if you're familiar with the uh, old Gang of Four design patterns or uh, Greger and uh, Bob's uh, patterns, microservice patterns, there are so many pattern books co coming all the way. But thing is, modern architectures, when you work with the serverless and um, uh, cloud, there are many patterns hidden within your architecture. Say, for example, Amazon API Gateway, most of us use every time, right? Do you know API Gateway itself is a pattern? Similarly, the dead letter Q, DLQ, is actually a pattern. But we have a service, we, product, we use all the time. And for us, we don't see that as a pattern. We see the outer architectural patterns, right? So that's, that's why you know, I like this quote that we need to keep in mind when we work with uh, you know, patterns in uh, um, you know, serverless. Let's start with one of the basic simple patterns, choreography. It's a twin. The other side of the, this one is orchestration. Though they are twins, they are completely you know, dissimilar. So they do different things. But when choreography and orchestration come together, we will see later on, you, know, you can do wonders with uh, uh, serverless. Right, so the name comes from you know, these uh, choreographing uh, events. So when you choreograph, you have one or a group of uh, dancers, they know what to do when the tune or music plays. You don't need to instruct. Each perform as per the, you know, the steps that needs to be done. Now, let's take an example. So you, you bought a kitchen equipment, you want to register it, and uh, you, if you register, you get few loyalty points, and also they also give you some discounts for your next purchase, and, uh, you know, they need to, you know, they inform the customer service for any issues and also inform the manufacturer. Looks kind of simple sequential. But thing is, not everything needs to be, you know, this way. And there is dependency because you need to register a product in order to generate your loyalty points. You need to have a discount code so that somebody can email, okay? And at the same time, there are things that can happen in uh, parallel like loyalty points computation or uh, discount code generation can happen in parallel, and also you know, some of the other things. So how do we take this into a choreographed event-driven architecture with uh, event bridge? Let's see. So we have an app, and that kind of interacts with a product registration service, and the product registration service emits an event to say that a product registered. Suddenly, there are different services coming alive. Oh, I want, I'm, I want to do that. I want something. I want something to do that with that event. So that's how event-driven architecture happens. And you know, the event bridge target sends these events to different uh, services. And then once the promotion is computed, the you know, discount goes generated event comes up, and there is somebody else interested in it to send to uh, customers or email to customers. And of course, there is a you know, manufacturing system, a third-party application that also needs to send, um, you know, uh, to be in, uh, invoked with a certain details. So that can be done even with an event bridge uh, uh, rule. So what we, what, we, what we can do here is with the API destination, which I will talk about later on. So this is a simple choreographed, you know, event-driven architecture with uh, Amazon Event Bridge. Okay, so things to uh, remember. So this is like coordination. It's not like uh, there's no control or instructing each one what to do. And then decouples, it, it allows it decouples. And also tomorrow if you want to bring up a new microservice, it's so easy to spin up a new microservice, make it part of the whole ecosystem. And item potency, and as I mentioned earlier on, 
uh, important for observability, you know, adding tracing attributes or tracing values and taking the values all the way through are crucial. Okay. Now, you go to a developer conference and they will say code is a liability. And you sit there and wonder, I don't understand this. I know financial liability, but what is code is liability? And go to the next session, they say, the code you write is legacy tomorrow. You think that, okay, I'm done. My job is over because I can't program anything. And go to the final session and to someone like Werner will say, the code you ever write is business logic. You think, that's it. Business people, stakeholders taking over. My job is done. Not necessarily. What this implies is don't do unnecessary programming or uh, implementation, okay? Why? If you reduce, reduce writing functions, there are a bunch of benefits. So less code, less security worries and things, uh, you know, worry about. There is less, you know, debugging hassles and all sorts of things um, uh, help you. And, uh, you know, reduction in your cost maybe. So this is where the next pattern comes in, functionless integration pattern. Now, it's also known as low code, codeless, you know, those sort of terminologies, but the concept is same. That means you don't write unnecessary custom functions when there is no need, right? So what is functionless? For that, you need to understand what is functionful. You must have come across this pattern architecture those hundreds of times. Now, if you look at the lambda function, you think, what is its role? Is it doing any business logic, or is it shifting the data from the API payload onto the queue? If it is just shifting the data, then it's not its strength. Lambda functions are compute, you need you know, logic to implement, et cetera. So this is an area you need to think whether I can be a functionless. So rather than doing a function, you think, oh, can I use native integrations to achieve the same thing? And this is kind of the starting point of your functionless thinking. Now, if you think of API get Gateway, it, it, it supports over 40 um, integrations through several AWS services, and I'm sorry, uh, um, and also the uh, step functions, it, it provides so many opportunities, especially with the SDK integration, to interact directly with you know, services without having the need to write Lambda functions. And last year's reInvent, the EventBridge Pipes was announced. This is again sort of a one-to-one -one, um, pipeline where you can do transformation and connect with the target services, in most cases without having to write a Lambda function. Okay? Now, let's take an example. Somebody registering an account with an online system, for example, so they add personal data, they give their payment details, and then these days you also need to capture their consent, whether they can be contacted with an email, can they get promotional stuff, et cetera, et cetera. So most business, this is not their strength. So they usually use a third-party application, send the data, only when necessary they, they query and get the, you know, the details back. And typically, you will have some kind of API that you invoke, just send the data. You don't expect anything else back. Now, this is an asynchronous invocation because it doesn't need to happen when the customer uh, registers. It can happen you know, behind the scene. And you, you have API supplied and they have quota and also they can have different authentication mechanism, open authentication or you know, other mechanisms. So when you think of implementing this as a you know, uh, architecture, so you have simple API gateway that returns a you know, acknowledgement back and pushes the details into a queue, and then you, some, you, have, you may have a pipes, and for the logic, you have, let's say, a step function. So a step function workflow then has different steps for different things, and there is a lambda function that is dedicated for contacting the uh, third-party application. All looks fine, there's nothing wrong here. Now, what happens? And one day, the system is down, or there is a flaky network connection. So to, to, to take care of this one, your architecture now needs dead letter queues in place. And when you have queues, you need to know how to handle 
okay? So you add more complexity into your architecture. Now, this is where one of the you know, uh, native integrations of EventBridge comes in, and that is API destinations. So you send an event to EventBus, and EventBus has a target rule, and the target here is an API destination that hits the, you know, the, the endpoint on the third-party system. Now, what is API destination? Now, API destination, uh, sorry, before I go there, have a look at this Lambda function in terms of the functionless concept we just discussed. Can you, can you, can you perform what this Lambda function does if it's just doing the transformation with uh, uh, the step functions, int intrinsic functions, and things like that? Then you may be able to get rid of the Lambda function altogether and just have your step emitting an event onto the bus. So this, again, kind of refining your architecture, making sure that you use the optimum uh, approaches or the patterns as you build your uh, serverless applications. Now, what is an API destination? The API destination is basically HTTP endpoints where it's a target for your event bridge rule, and uh, you can use it to have a functionless way of sending or invoking your external uh, targets. So typically, the customer registered event comes in to the event bus. You have a filter to know, okay, so this is the customer you know, registered event, so I need, to, I need to do something. And you may be doing some event transformation, and then you, you know, give it to API destination. So API destination has two parts. So you need to have your connection. This is where all the authentication, the credentials, and things happen. And then, obviously, you have your endpoint with all your headers and all sorts of stuff, and that can, you know, uh, gets, gets to the uh, fi final target, which is your external application or a different service in a different domain. Now, if you just, if, if I show you the, you know, the structure of API destination, so it has like a connection and the target HTTP endpoint, and if you look at connection, EventBridge supports these three forms. I'm not sure if anyone is still using basic auth, but it's there. And then API key mechanism, and of course, the OAuth. Uh, where you can kind of supply your uh, token credentials for a, you know, event bridge to deal with behind the scenes. And the endpoint side, you can get hit uh, any custom endpoints and also uh, the uh, event bridge partner endpoints as well. So this is so cool that uh, if one of your partners work with is part of uh, the event bridge uh, you know, destination partner scheme, it becomes so simple and easy. Um, okay, so that's API destination. One of the important points with the destination is when it comes to credentials, EventBridge keeps the credentials in Secrets Manager. When you hear Secrets Manager, you may think, oh, that's going to be costly because every secret is like 40 cents per month and then API invocation costs, et cetera, et cetera. The good news is, irrespective of how many times this invocation happens, millions of times or millions of times, even bridge consumes the cost. So we don't pay for the, you know, the secrets manager cost ourselves. It's all covered, consumed by uh, even bridge. And then you can, you can add rate limiting and it supports a retry. Another thing you need to be, remember, you need to be mindful of is that uh, the timeout is five seconds. If the target takes long, it will drop and sort of get into the, you know, the retry uh, mode. And, um, <clears throat> I had written a blog a while ago. It goes into the you know, sort of details of how we can do this, uh, <clears throat> the whole thing. Right, so let's move on. When you think of a reliable application, you think of resiliency, high availability, all sorts of things. These are crucial when it comes to serverless and event-driven architecture, especially distributed microservices and things. And uh, there are different ways we can do. And why we need all these things? Because, as I, as I just showed you in the previous case, network connection can be flaky. And uh, the system could be down for maintenance or whatever. And then the traffic pattern could vary and completely surprise everyone and take the whole thing down. So these are all eventualities you, you come across in a production environment almost every day. So that's the reason why we need to build all the capabilities as part of our architecture when we design these uh, solutions. So one of the patterns, it's a very common, popular pattern that we can use 
is the event broker pattern. But what I'm going to do here is explain event broker, uh, sorry, event breaker pattern, and also I will add on how can you take care of the failures with the retry mechanism as well. So if you're new to uh, circuit breaker, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's simply the concept from the you know, electrical circuits. So a circuit is closed when everything goes through fine. So in here, the green arrow means it's closed, everything is happy, it's a 200 OK going all the way through to your client. It's a synchronous invocation, happy. So in an open circuit situation, so same kind of pattern, but there is a problem reaching your target. So you can't reach the target because it's down or something happened. So your circuit now is marked as open. So that means you're not able to, you're not going to reach the target, but you return a failure or error response to your client or a consumer. So this is like the more two common things. And there is a half open, et cetera, but let's leave that for, for the time being to keep things simple. Okay? Now, circuit breaker, I usually term this call as a manager because in our implementations, the manager's responsibility is to know when to declare a circuit as open, when to close, because the applications rely on this status before deciding what to do with the uh, with, uh, request they have in hand. So simple thing that we can do is we can store the status of your uh, you know, endpoint or the target system, and then do or react based on its situation. For example, first you check, the, before you invoke the third party, you check the status. Okay, if it's kind of closed, good to go. Okay, I'll call it. And then that goes through. And then you, another request comes along, and you check it's fine, but you try to hit it, you see that it's not going through. The circuit is, for some reason, it's, it's open. So what happens is you update the status store to say that, oh, hang on, it's, you know, there's some problem. So you have some logic to, um, you know, identify when to declare that as, a, you know, open circuit. So that means the error response goes back and uh, your system kind of, you know, takes care of those things. You're not kind of, you know, waiting for the target to come back alive and, uh, you know, adding latency to the request and things like that. So usually when you, when you, when you decide, when your application or the logic decides when to declare as a closed or open, it's based on certain things. You probably won't declare as a, you know, closed circuit as soon as one request goes through. You may want to try out five or 10 requests within a shorter period of time. So this is part of your circuit manager's you know, uh, logic. So that's kind of the, you know, the threshold that you uh, usually set. And uh, so this is the simple way of doing it. Now, if you take it to one step further, you can even build this as a service. For example, you have a, you have a critical third party or external application that many systems rely on. And what you can do is you can set up a dedicated um, status checker. So you have a simple scheduler that comes alive once in a while, maybe, I don't know, once every minute or two, et cetera performs the heartbeat of the external application and sets the status in a DynamoDB table, for example. And every time an update happens, the table emits an event, the, you know, the stream event, and there is a handler and uh, looking for this or capturing all this coming along. And this is basically the manager because it receives the status updates as they come along. So it can then decide when to make the status changes like I, you know, what I mentioned early on. Now, benefit is the same manager can update other places. For example, he can also keep things in a uh, SSM parameter store attribute. So if it's within your boundary, your service can check the SSM parameter to see the status. Or if it's uh, you know, another microservice or another application, you can emit an event, you know, the operational event I mentioned early on, so that can be consumed by different applications so to get the status uh, details back. And of course, you can also attach an API gateway endpoint that can simply query the you know, relevant field from the uh, Dynamo table and report the status back. So this is kind of evolving your simple circuit breaker implementation. Of course, there are different ways to do it, 
but this is something you know uh, worth uh, experimenting if you have these sort of use cases in place. Now, as I mentioned, there are different ways for different consuming parties, especially within your own account, within your own bounded context, you can use certain things. If it's external, you can, you can, you can go via events or uh, you know, uh, APIs, so it makes everything you know, simple and clean. Now, one of the common things you have when you have a circuit breaker is to fail fast. So that means, if your circuit is open, you can't go, you immediately fail back. That means you're not holding on to resources or uh, you know, adding latency. For that, you do a simple service check, status of the service, and decide what to do. So it just goes back as an error. It's a simple and most common case that you will find. And it's fine in most cases. But the problem is, if you're handling, if you got a you know, customer's order in your hands, you can't simply fail back and say, sorry, and I can't do anything. You have to you know, have the data and resubmit to your downstream application so they can you know, get their orders delivered, et cetera, et cetera. So this is where we need to kind of think of not just failing fast, you need to have the replay mechanism in place. So in this case, what happens is like uh, when, it's, uh, when it's a failure, when you can't get to the other end, you write somewhere, you write the failed request so that when the circuit is break, back, you can replay. Three common ways, two most common ways you will find this implemented. One is with SQS queues, and then DynamoDB table based on your query requirements and access patterns and things like that. And the, the third option now you can use is with event bridge, archive, and replay, okay? Right. Stay with me, it's going to have a little bit trickier if you are new to archive and play. Now, what is event bridge archive and play? It's simple like how you set the filter, but you identify a pattern for events and then say these events I want to keep in an event bridge archive. So they, they go to this archive and you decide how long you need to keep in the archive and then you can replay events from the archive from a particular, you know, for a time frame, from this time to this time. Okay, come on, replay the events from this particular archive. So it's a simple mechanism, but really useful uh, help in, uh, and helps in um, uh, several situations. Now, you know, the simple thing, you do a status check and then you think what you need to do. And uh, so sometimes it's useful, especially when you work with events, to have this sort of status of certain things reflected in your event. So for example, a successful submission or invocation is 200 okay, fine, nobody is going to question. But you, if you get into an error, then that is due to your data issue, validation issue, this you can classify as hard error. This, the situation is, however many times you resubmit, this is not going to go through because it's, it's your problem, you have a problem with the data. And the third type is retriable status. So this is where your third party down or you get a 500 service error, et cetera, et cetera. You need to collect those things and retry. So it's, it's useful if you can, you know, kind of have this sort of classification in your events. It helps to, um, you know, with the replay archive mechanism. So this is kind of a simple metadata I mentioned. Uh, so I show here with the status and based on the status, you can now set a rule in event bridge. So event bridge, you can have a rule to capture those retriable status events and push them into an archive. So this is like a typical, um, you know, the filter rule you may have. Your, of course, your, you know, situations will vary, but this is kind of the basic thing. Now, archive creation is simple. All you need is, uh, you know, a bunch of cloud formation scripts or, uh, you know, other ways of doing it with a filter pattern, and uh, that's how it sets. Now, replaying events from archive, so you have things pulled here. Now, your status is, your system is now back up, so you have some kind of events flowing through. You can have a logic implementer, you can have a Lambda handler, will kind of know that, okay, 
you know, this is up now. I need to replay from this particular archive because it's all part of how you uh, set up. And you'll say that, okay, it was down last time. I mean, this point is up here, so I should be replaying the events from this point to this point onwards. So then event bridge will replay those events, push those events back onto the, you know, the same bus, and you can have your handler deal with the uh, events um, to, to do this. One thing you notice here I highlighted is a replay name. You might be thinking that wasn't part of your you know, event uh, uh, structure. So this attribute, AWS adds to the event when it replays it for a reason, so that you can differentiate the replayed event from the original event and avoid the sort of a cyclic nature of events going through. This is important. And you can kind of set the replay name so that you can kind of set the filter patterns accordingly. Right, so key points. Um, there's no order guarantee, so as, as with the event bridge as of now. And uh, speed, there is no way to control the speed. When you replay, it just kind of you know, puts everything, so you need to have uh, buffering or queuing mechanism downstream to um, um, you know, cater for that. Now, I usually recommend granular archives. Don't just go one global archive, dump everything. Just keep one archive for that specific purpose, and that you know, helps a lot with our managing, uh, us managing the archives. Another crucial point, there is a delay between the last event that pushed into your archive and you can replay that. So there is usually typically a five minutes gap or more before the latest event that went into the archive can be replayed. So keep that in mind and uh, if your use case is fine with that, then this is the best option uh, to do that. And um, again, I have a blog uh, detailing and going through all these things. Okay, let's move on to one of the other prominent patterns, orchestration. This is the twin of the choreography I mentioned. Now, with orchestration, it's again based on, you know, the name comes from the orchestra. There is always a controller, right, instructing what to do, uh, which part of the orchestra, et cetera. So there's a similar concept here. So usually when, when we say orchestration, immediately AWS step functions come into the picture because that's sort of the, you know, state machine orchestration. Now, I usually talk about three types of orchestration. It's all about keeping things simple, clean. In-service orchestration, cross-service, and distributed. Distributed and cross-service are kind of similar. I'll show you the way I differentiate. In-service is simple. Let's say you have a domain, and it has a microservice, and it has a you know, step function. Let's keep it at a domain level. Don't go into the bounded context. Um, it's fine, it's an API you know, invokes the step function, it does some logic. You see here, everything is within that microservice. There is no arrow going outside the, you know, the boxes. So this is even in-service. This is the perfect and simple form. There is no dependency, there is no hardwiring, et cetera. So in terms of um, the cross-service, this is slightly broadening the, you know, uh, the, the event uh, the, the uh, orchestration. So here, similar service, but it has needs to reach out to other microservices within the domain or even other domains. So what it does is like it reaches out via, mostly via API calls. So typically you will have a Lambda function to do that, but recently in the last day or so, there's a new um, feature or announcement like from step functions, you can directly hit uh, HTTP targets now. So that again makes the, your functional of, functionless life uh, simple and easy. Right, so this is like a cross service. Let's move on to the, the next one. That's the distributed um, you know, orchestration. Now, let me, let me bring three domains to explain the concept. Stick with me, this probably can you know, uh, confuse some of you, but uh, follow me. Let's say three domains, and each domain you have three uh, microservices. So for example, domain A, that is the kind of the controller or primary orchestration. Think in terms of, say, I don't know, um, insurance claim processing, because there you have legal parties coming in or uh, you know, car dealers or manufacturers, so, so on and so forth. So it can be kind of a complicated process. Now, say uh, task A2 requires something to be done by uh, service B. 
So this could take hours to complete. And on the other side, so you have a different task in your primary orchestrator, orchestrator that reaches out to a different service. It may take weeks to complete. So, so the main orchestrator now needs to wait until it gets answers from these different uh, you know, uh, services. It could be, you know, I'm just showing um, uh, as orchestration workflow, but it could be you know, other implementation as well. Now, how, how can we do? So this is where orchestration and choreography comes together. So the way to do is, is like uh, A2 pushes an event with what we know as task tokens, task tokens of uh, step functions. So a token within an event goes to the service, and similarly, for the other service, on a different parallel arm, there's a different uh, event goes out with a different token, and these tasks wait there until the respective tokens come back to the step function. And so the token comes back. I'm just, I'm not showing the, you know, sort of event bus or event bridge here just for clarity. So the event comes back and the task moves move forward. Until that point, it will just stay there. I will expand this in a little bit more detail for you to understand. So task emits an event with a token. It goes to event bridge and there's a consumer, which is my, you know, uh, microservice C and it consumes, it knows Okay, I have an event, I have a to token, I need to kind of keep, keep the token and send the token back in my response and that goes back to event bridge and then event bridge, the, the, the microservice A consumes that event with the token so it has a handler to, um, to, to process that event and the handler will submit the token to the step function and the step function will carry on. So. So this is how roughly how the task token mechanism works. It's so powerful. You haven't, if you haven't tried, I would recommend that you try it out. It's it's, it's so cool. Um, it's only supported with the standard, uh, you know, uh, state machines or uh, uh, the step functions at the moment. Now, this is fine. Now, how do you add an event with a token to the bus? It's so simple. As part of your task, there is something called wait for task token. So that is kind of the you know, step that we emit and it will stay there until the, you know, the token is back. And then you can inject a token by calling the task token. So that's sort of the you know, a step functions construct. You can attach to any of your attributes. It doesn't need to be task token attribute. You can call any of the attributes so your consumers know that okay, this attribute carries a token I should honor and return back. Right. So key points in terms of distribution. So multiple task tokens you can use. They are all unique. And uh, you, know, you, can, you can use SQS or SNS or whatever. For example, I showed the step functions on the other services, but could be anything. And the timeout, the heartbeat understanding is important. What happens is when you emit the token, you set a timer. I want to wait for, say, 20 hours. Now, if the token didn't come back after 20 years, the task will time out. So this is where the retry status messages I mentioned earlier help, because then the token handler can understand and increase the heartbeat so it won't time out. It will wait for longer, for allowing time for the other service to complete and the token to come back before it can kind of you know, carry on. So you can say success or failure or, uh, as I mentioned, uh, extend the, you know, uh, the time out as well. So again, there is a blog that you can follow if you're interested. And the um, final one, bounded context we all know, right? So Domain-driven design, bounded context. Now, how many of us respect boundaries with events as we do with APIs. With APIs, we have all sorts of things, payload contract and security, et cetera, et cetera. But when it comes to event, we are so relaxed. We just send events all around. So that is a pattern we can use, what I call as a gatekeeper pattern. So this is a way of kind of guarding your domain or a bounded context boundary. So just to explain, so for example, you have a payment processing system which has a bunch of microservices. 
It has an internal bus where all the events flow into, but at some point, this needs to send certain details and invocation to external um, you know, targets or applications. So finance domain needs uh, domain events, for example. And then you have a third-party application that requires some data to be sent, and then you have a checkout bounder context that may be interested in certain events from the payments uh, boundary as well. So this is a situation you can even simply manage with a single bus. So this is where a different thought process I usually recommend to teams is to separate the, the external communications with a different event bus within your bounded context, what I call the gatekeeper bus, or you can call as an external bus. So the idea here is that the internal event bus that doesn't care anything about cross accounts or who are the external consumers. Its focus is purely within the bounded context dealing with the microservice events, all sorts of events. Whereas the external or a gatekeeper bus only deals with the domain events that needs to go out or the cross account rules that allows you to share events with uh, you know, other domains or other bounded context. It's just a way of kind of separating and keeping things simple. So that's it. Now, <clears throat> it's, it, as I mentioned, it's just kind of a mechanism to, you know, kind of clear the things, keep things simple uh, in your implementation. So like I mentioned, the gatekeeper bus is the one that will have all the, you know, rules and stuff. Now, the key points, as with the event bridge, um, it, you know, it, it reduces complexity, but also you need to be think in terms of all the, you know, ordering issues with the event bridge, et cetera. So it can act as like a typical anti-corruption layer. So you can easily set up a microservice to go with uh, uh, the, you know, the, event, the gatekeeper bus and you can have all your transformation logic in here. Say, for example, one consumer requires the events to be transformed as cloud events, then you can have those things covered uh, as well. Right. So we come to the you know, end of the patterns thing. So let's look at some of the three of the common questions I get asked every time. First question often people ask is, how many event buses should I have? Can I have an enterprise-wide bus, or a domain bus, or a bounded context bus? I mean, you can have you know, combinations of these things. The problem is, with the enterprise bus, you obviously you can think of all the different events going in, so you need to have some kind of governance built on top of your event bridge. So for example, how can you automatically onboard, offboard producers and consumers? So these are the things you need to be you know, mindful of. It's not that simple because when you have different uh, domains and events, push events and consume events. So domain level event bus is a bit simple but still adds complexity depending on the, you know, the setup of your business domain. But again, it would be you know, useful to have those sort of uh, governance in place and the schema validation, et cetera, in place. Domain, sorry, bounded context bus is a bit more easier because that sits within your own two piece of team boundary. So you won't, you decide with a gatekeeper bus how to share events, et cetera. The next common question is, should I use event bridge or kinesis? Can I replace kinesis with event bridge? The way I say is, kinesis has a purpose. It is there for cloud scale event ingestion or streaming, I call it as a streamer. Whereas I consider event bridges a bit more refined, you know, event handling mechanism with your uh, microservices or applications. You don't just dump everything into event bridge. So it's more of a choreographer. And of course, there are differences in payload sizes and uh, how long the events can be kept. And these are the things, you know, obviously differ service to service, but have that in mind. Unless you have a valid use case, leave what is best for kinesis to kinesis and do what is best for you know, uh, handling even, even bridge events that way. Right, um, finally, this again a common question. There are three different services, which one should I use? Again, there are commonalities, of course they're all asynchronous, there are, you know, commonalities in terms of purpose and things. SQS is for queuing, buffering. SNS is the typical pub sub model with the topics. Event Bridge is a broker. It's a kind of a choreographing your services coordinator. And then message flow. 
in some cases with SQS, you can adjust uh, with its characteristics, you can adjust. Whereas with uh, event bridge, at the moment there is no way. You need to put a uh, queue or something on the other side of consumption to you know, slow down things. And uh, FIFO is another differentiator. As of now, event bridge does not support FIFO uh, or uh, you know, sort of the ordered um, events. And then the batching. So with SQS, you can, when you process, you can pull one or up to 10,000 messages in one batch and process. Uh, we don't have that capability with, uh, you know, event bridge at this at, at, at the moment. So these are sort of the basic, you know, uh, concepts and differentiators and uh, similarities you probably worth need, you know, keep in mind. And uh, that's all. So thank you all so much for listening. Thank you so much, and please complete the survey. Thank you.